So our next video this morning is from Peter Haviland, who's the Chief Technology Officer at Latitude Financial Services. Peter has nearly three decades of experience spanning financial services, management consulting, technology, and energy. He's currently working as CTO of Neobank Latitude Financial Services, focused upon leading the digital agile transformation of the company. He served as the vice chair of the Open Group Architecture Forum and a member of the Open Group Governing Board. Peter will look at the issues faced when protecting against digital disruption, how organizations can innovate to accelerate digital transformation, the capabilities required to realize a digital business, and how you architect the digital business. So please, let's, uh, let's hear from Peter Haviland. My name is Peter Haviland, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about the next section here around what capabilities are required to realize a digital business, um, how do we architect a digital enterprise, and is, you know, what makes it different from others. Uh, I'm sure capability modeling is no uh, is nothing new to a lot of you guys. Um, I tell you what though, getting a good capability model is pretty hard, isn't it? Um, anyone it seems can put out a capability model these days with 200 boxes on it, but I think the aim of the game for us is to actually choose the ones which are gonna be really valuable for us in our, in our daily uh, existences. Um, and I think the acid test, or maybe the thing that's interesting to mention or talk about is that these capabilities in a digital agile business basically have to be as autonomous as possible in order to give us the maximum speed. And this I think is where the real rub um, is, is where the real rub is. I've tried to very quickly here put down a couple of capabilities I think might be worthy of examination in this context. Um, starting with things around strategic marketing, personalization, digital distribution, things like that. Moving quite quickly into the experience layer, what I've tried to do in some cases is show a progression. So most companies, for example, would start with a consistent experience across product or channel, move then into a responsive situation where that experience is in fact capable of responding to various inputs. And then lastly, the achievement of an evolutionary experience where it is almost always changing. And indeed, the experience is in itself a major value driver for customer acquisition and retention. Decisioning is a huge uh, component for us and I imagine a huge component for a lot of other companies. What's interesting for me though at least, uh, if I think about how we used to do architectures or indeed how I've done a lot of architectures, the idea of a decision based architecture I guess is not something that's um, been at the forefront. So the idea now that you would model decisions as first class citizens and then you would seek to understand how to manage those and automate those uh, and then um, provide a degree of traceability and transparency to your customers as well as regulators, um, I think is something a little bit new and something that's probably going to grow as well in the future. Um, partner interaction, ecosystem enablement, and indeed the interaction of, uh, sorry, the integration of customers with pro the product development lifecycle is also something I think is worthy of attention. The idea that you would externalize uh, some APIs or some features from your own platform, it's not really a new one, but I think it continues to be a major value driver of some of our more successful digital agile businesses out there. Data is in itself a huge aspect and indeed has its own capability model. But again, I think for a business of, that has these aspirations, the idea of capturing all data all the time, especially for interactions from customers and partners, being able to understand that, being able to source that, analyze it, and then get insight from that, that then influences your product strategy or your experience strategy is fairly critical to your ability to get this flywheel type effect up and running where you can constantly understand customer needs and respond quickly. The call is core, one of my favorite sayings. Uh, the idea that your core transaction systems don't really resemble a traditional core system anymore. They're hyper scalable, they're hyper distributed, they're quite um, isolated in their context. They have little independent microservices being called from all over the place. Uh, there's data sharding, there's uh, polyglot persistence, there's data gravity at play so that you really try to reduce as many bottlenecks as possible. It's not really about a you know, single point of failure anymore, it's about a single point of speed. You now we want a lot of scalability, we want a lot of performance, and we want a lot of reliability all the time. Uh, so that's really those sorts of characteristics, I think, in that space. Um, from an operating model perspective, I think it's interesting to go into these in a bit more detail is the idea that we have certain operating model characteristics that are needed in order to make this happen. We also have certain design 
philosophies and certain engineering practices which are needed to make this happen. And finally, we have certain architectures, certain solutions, certain patterns which are also needed. Um, I don't know that you can actually do this without these others in concert. Um, so I think going forward, maybe we'll see capability models actually also talk about the company's operating model or its execution capability as importantly as it does some of these others. We'll put the rest there for now. We can come back to those. So firstly, just quickly, the idea of a biz dev SecOps operating model. Uh, it's written a little differently. You see it written DevOps, DevSecOps, biz dev SecOps, biz arc ops. The idea though that we have these capabilities that are relatively isolated from others. It means there's less interdependency. It means there's less bureaucracy. It means they can respond faster, they can move quicker, and we actually have better ecosystem resiliency because even a small failure in one component doesn't hit uh, a failure in another component. And remember in this case, where the most ambitious companies are actually trying to replicate that in their business operating model, as well as their technology architecture. Um, from an operating model point of view, things like inverse Conway maneuvers in the org structure, continuous control environments to handle regulatory compliance uh, and cyber security, things like that, as well as techniques like outcome-based contracting, which seek to look at the value delivered through partnerships rather than maybe a traditional uh, perspective, which was more about costs under management. Um, from a design technique point of view, there's quite a bit on this out there right now. Personally, I find it's quite important to stay on top of it and to always be experimenting to see what's going to work for you, what doesn't. Techniques like design thinking are great for putting the customer first, putting them in the middle, and also putting in a bit more of a continuous improvement, continuously evaluating um, sense and respond type footing. Um, Set-based concurrent engineering, wonderful technique for keeping engineering teams um, in that problem space for as long as possible, really minimizing those type one decisions, really maximizing the type two decisions. And lastly, domain-driven design, a wonderful architecture pattern, uh, an enterprise architecture um, approach, if you will, that helps to define these independent domains in isolated contexts, which again means we can run technology stacks independently of another we can use them in different contexts, we can drive reuse, and we can improve resiliency. From an engineering point of view, a couple of things also to throw in the mix. Things like solution train engineering, fitness functions, and release on demand capability are fairly, fairly uh, aspirational for many companies, but they also represent some pretty serious engineering capability if, you, if you're able to have these characteristics. Fitness functions are great for dealing with finance functions who need continuous uh, justification for improvement of capability and release on demand is really the, 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 the pinnacle of what we want to get to to decouple the deployment from the actual release so we can do things like canary testing and AB testing, um, blue green deployments, things like that. Last but not least, a couple of things around architecture. The event driven reactive independent service model, it's kind of microservices but I think it's a bit more mature than microservices. Really what we're looking for is independent services, that's key. Streams of record, that really underpins and drives your eventual consistency. Having streams of record is great for um, reducing your dependence on, on databases of record. You know, databases are hard, databases are hard to upgrade, they're hard to deploy, they're hard to drop, they're hard to restore, you don't wanna change schemas. There's plenty not to like about them. Streams of record is an interesting um, concept that really can uh, help uh, if you're experiencing challenges like that. And lastly, eventual consistent data architecture. Um, you know, there's, there's strongly consistent data architectures which rely heavily on relational databases. There's eventually consistent data architectures that allow you to use different, more scalable uh, databases, uh, particularly NoSQL databases. Um, they're good for different uh, contexts, you certainly need both in your landscape. I think the idea though that we would instead default to an eventually consistent data architecture as opposed to a strongly typed one, which is probably what we did in the past, is really what we're trying to call out here. Again, if you can maximize your use of eventual consistency, you can, you can maximize your use of um, self-healing systems, you get better scalability, you have better ecosystem resiliency, um, and you know those deployments uh, don't have to be so fraught with danger. 
So that's just a little quick whistle stop tour of some of those. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. I can't wait to talk a little more to you about these. I've got a few examples in the pack. Um, let me know, please. And uh, yeah, have a great day. Alrighty, bye-bye.